This is Winchester Academy. our speaker. I'm sure many of you know or have, have met Carlene Staney, um, a local Wapaka um, person. She is a doctor of veterinary medicine. She has lived in Durango, Colorado for many years and practices um, acupuncture um, with all different kinds of animals and has great success um, with both acupuncture and herbal healing of animals. She has studied, um, she studied in Florida with a Dr. Shu, who she said was absolutely remarkable as a, a Chinese teacher for her, and um, has traveled to China to learn even more about acupuncture. So she's very, very well versed and uh, loves what she does, and does it from her home, so people will come across state lines to have her treat their animals that they love. So let's, um, she's also an author, so you'll see up here we have her books, um, for sale, The Spiritual Nature of Animals. So if you are interested, you certainly are welcome to come and purchase a copy um, from John and Nancy. Nancy thank you. <laughs> I forgot Nancy's name um, at the end of the program. So let's give a very, very warm welcome to Carlene Stegney. Thank you all for coming and thank you to our sponsors. This is wonderful to have such a great group. So I'll begin. When we look into an animal's eyes, something touches us. Something more than fur and feathers, flesh and bones connects with us. Someone lives inside. What is that? The time has come to understand the spiritual nature of animals. As I go over the world's religious and spiritual teachings about animals, please remember, this is an academic review. You're invited to believe whatever you want. <laughs> One day, about 20 years ago, I was working at Durango Animal <laughs> Hospital, and a woman came in the exam room carrying a fishing basket. She started out by saying, I've never liked cats. <laughs> and I've noticed a couple of feral cats living in the woods near our house. And she explained that it was a warm spring day and she had the sliding glass door open to the deck. And she was talking on the telephone when she noticed these two cats come onto the deck. But before she could react, they poked their heads through the door and dropped this, she said as she opened the basket. Inside was a very tiny, very fuzzy, butterscotch-colored kitten. He was emaciated and very hungry. I gave her a can of kitten milk replacer and said, it looks like you got yourself a cat. <laughs> she agreed she might have to keep it. At that time, the scientific literature stated that non-human animals were not conscious and did not feel love. I had also heard my entire life that non-human animals do not have souls. Imagine my confusion. What kind of unconscious, non-loving, soulless beings would drop their starving baby on the doorstep? Veterinarians witness this kind of compassionate behavior on the part of animals all the time. I wondered how people could make such statements about animals. Also about that time, I had two clients with widely varying views about what happens to an animal after death. The Buddhist wanted me to help her dog die naturally. She had taken the Buddhist vow, the first precept, to not kill, and she could not elect euthanasia. She did not want the dog to suffer, but she believed that it was better for the dog to suffer his karma in this life so he would have a better incarnation in his next life. It took me, this is all new to me, and it took me a little while to figure out how to help. 
But we finally decided to stop the prednisone medication that was keeping the dog alive, and it died overnight. The Baptist was an elderly ranch woman who hired me to euthanize her old horse. She, there was really nothing wrong with the horse. She just told me she didn't believe in letting him get old and suffer. She told me that her husband had died in her arms a few years previous. And so when I pronounced the horse dead, I said, now he and your, horse are, now he and your husband are together. And she screeched at me, no, they're not. My husband's in heaven and that horse is just dead. I said, well, where'd the energy go that was just there? I don't know, it's just gone. She said, and she started quoting Bible verses. Well, I can quote Bible verses, too. So we had a very long, very interesting, <laughs> very respectful conversation. And so I asked her, do you believe in reincarnation? She said, no, that's when you come back as an animal. I said, well, not necessarily. She said, she quoted the Bible again. She said, there will be a new heaven, a new earth, a new Jerusalem, and body and soul will be reunited. I said, that sounds like a definition of reincarnation to me. <laughs> well, maybe it does, she said. So these people made me wonder, what happens to an animal after it dies? Does it reincarnate, or is it just dead meat? So I spent 20 years doing research and compiled it into a book, The Spiritual Nature of Animals, A Country Vet Explores the Wisdom, Compassion, and Souls of Animals. It includes many fun stories about the local people and places around Durango, Colorado, and lots of fun stories about animal behavior as, from my perspective, a country vet. It also contains extensive research into the world's religious, scientific, and spiritual teachings about the non-physical aspect of animals. The third component is my journey towards spiritual growth as I wrote the book. Veterinary medicine is disturbing. We see a lot of death and gore. We witness tremendous suffering on the parts of the animals we adore. So this was a healthy diversion for me. And the lessons I learned helped me become a healthier, happier person. I am a scientist, a doctor of veterinary medicine, and it's science that made me believe in spirituality. Here's why. When I was a young child, my father, who's sitting in the front row, just turned 96, taught high school chemistry. And I remember him coming home and gathering the basketball, volleyball, softball, saw hardball, tennis ball, golf ball, all the balls in the house and arranging them around to demonstrate how the solar system, how the planets revolve around the sun in the solar system. And he told me that the space between the balls was energy that held the planets together and apart. I also learned that everything is made of atoms. And like the solar system, the atomic particles are held together and apart by energy which is mostly empty space. Modern science confirms that the universe is mostly empty space. Modern science tells us that we only see about 5% of what exists. The other 95% is invisible and unmeasurable. They don't know what it is. Furthermore, the 5% we do see is mostly empty space. The only reason we see a table is because of the way our eyes interpret the light energy reflecting off the energy between the atomic particles of the table. Our brain translates that information and creates the images we see. The material world is a mental construct. <coughs> Our brains create, create this visible images. So I call this non-material animating energy spiritual. Another law of science that makes me con be convinced of spirituality is the sec first law of thermodynamics. 
it states that energy is neither created nor destroyed, it merely changes form. So I ask you, if an archer shoots a bull elk in the heart and it drops dead, where did that animating vital life force go? If these laws of science are correct, it is eternal and transformative. The challenge for veterinarians is how to cope. Our lives, our days are filled with death and gore. We're haunted at night, we can't sleep. And so after 15 years of doing emergency medicine, I was about to spontaneously combust from burnout <laughs> when this book project changed my life. It became my passion and my salvation. I set out to understand the spiritual nature of animals, and in so doing, I discovered my own. I learned about the anima, what Jungian psychology refers to as the true inner self. Anima is the Latin root of the word animal. It means soul, breath, and life. It is, I mentioned, some people that believe that only human animals have souls, and that non-human animals don't, or they have a lower soul and not an eternal spirit. They argue that in the Bible, Adam only received the breath of life from God, and the animals did not. This breath of life is the eternal Holy Spirit that supposedly the animals did not receive. But animals breathe and have life. So if God didn't give them the breath of life, where did they get it? Nowhere in the Bible does it say that animals do not have souls or eternal spirits. On the contrary, Ecclesiastes 3.18 through 19 states, I said in my heart with respect to the sons of men that God is testing them to show them that they too are but beasts. For the fate of the sons of man and the fate of the beasts is the same. As one dies, so dies the other. And they all have the same breath, from the Hebrew word ruach, spirit meaning spirit, and man has no advantage over the beasts, for all is vanity. The human ego makes us so vain that we think we're superior spiritually, but the Bible states right here we're animals too, we're the same. Our egos are the one thing we do have in superior <laughs> qualities to the other animals. We don't have sonar like bats and dolphins. We don't have the olfaction of a bear or a dog. We don't have the vision of an eagle. And our, we can't uh, camouflage our arms and taste with our tentacles like the octopus. We're different, not better. Our egos make us creative, more creative than the other animals. They also make us vain. My favorite story my favorite Bible story comes from Numbers 22, 21 through 35, the story of Balaam's ass. How many of you know it? Right? Okay, it's great. It's a good story. So at that time, the Israelites had left, fled Egypt in search of the prom They fled slavery in Egypt in search of the promised land. And they camped in the land of Moab. And there were thousands of them, so the Moabites were upset by their presence. So the king of the Moabites hired the prophet Balaam to curse the Israelites. So Balaam got on his donkey and headed out to do the job. But God didn't want Balaam to curse the Israelites, and he placed an angel with a sword in Balaam's path. Balaam didn't see the angel, but the ass did, and she turned away, and Balaam smacked her. So he tried another route, along a wall. But when the donkey saw the angel with the sword, she scraped Balaam's leg against the wall, and it hurt him, and he hit her again. So now Balaam tried a third route, where the donkey couldn't turn either direction. So when the ass saw the angel, she just laid down. And Balaam whacked her a third time. Then the Lord opened the donkey's mouth, and she spoke, saying, Why have you struck me these three times? Aren't I your good ass? You've ridden your whole life? Have you ever known me to act like this before? Balaam was so angry. 
Then the Lord opened Balaam's eyes, and he saw the angel who spoke, saying, Just now I was going to spare your ass and smite you for disobeying God. <laughs> this story brings up two important points about animals. First, the donkey saw the angel of the Lord, and the prophet did not. How can a being without a spirit see a spiritual being? Indeed, shamans and Tibetan Buddhists agree that animals can see spirit realm better than humans can. Shamans say that animal language is just a variant of spirit language. That's why animals have extra information regarding phenomena such as earthquakes, tsunamis, volcanoes, and forest fires, and they flee the area. Animals sense energy. A research project done at the Swedish Agricultural University showed that if a person leading or riding a horse has an increase in heart rate, the horse has an increase in heart rate. Animals sense our energy. You know a dog can tell if they like someone right now or not. They don't have to get to know them. They just know. The moral of the story of Balaam's ass is, the next time an animal you know well behaves strangely about something, rather than getting angry, pay attention. This is the Monastery of Christ in the Desert near Abiquiu, New Mexico. We visited there and I spoke with the monk who was working as a wrangler and I mentioned that animals see spirit realm better than humans can and he said, oh, I have no doubt about that. He said, uh, we have an angel guarding the monastery and every time I ride a horse by that place they always shy away. The second point of the story of Balaam's ass is that the donkey spoke. What is this, Disney? No. <laughs> this is ancient Hebrew literature, and a common theme across cultures from creation stories is that at one time humans and animals could communicate, just like the snake spoke with Eve in the Garden of Eden. When I first started writing this book, I was completely skeptical about animal communicators. My intention, however, was to be open-minded and present unbiased view of the different teachings. So I enrolled in an animal communication apprenticeship and learned to speak to animals. And what I found is that we do it all the time. The problem is we don't listen and we project our way of thinking onto them rather than understanding their perspective. For example, my friend asked me to talk to her horse. She had a gelding and an old mare, and she got another young mare. And this young mare came in and started pushing the gelding off the food and eating all the food. And she was worried that she was bullying her gelding and not being nice to him and not letting him have enough food. And so she told me, I asked me if I would talk to him and find out what she, he, he thought about her and said she would get rid of that mare if he wanted her to. So all you do is open your heart to the animal and you ask a question and then you listen. You might hear words, you might feel sensations, you might get images. So I asked him, how do you think of her? And he, I could feel and hear him say that he liked her. And then I told him, well, your person is concerned that she's being mean to you and taking all the food, and she will get rid of her if you want her to. And I could feel how upset he was. He said, that's my mare. Oh, I went, oh, I'm talking to a horse. In the <coughs> wild, horses function as matriarchal bands. Mares are the bosses. The males just argue about which mares are theirs. <laughs> mares are territory. <clears throat> so then I asked him, is there anything else you need? And he said, we need more food. 
<laughs> like a concerned guardian, he was more concerned about the group than his own personal welfare. The oldest living religion on earth comes from the Australian Aborigine. <coughs> Their creative ancestors were unbound vibratory fields of energy. They created with their breath by naming. They dreamed of things and named them. Ants, wallabies, emus. And they could transform from one into the other. From an animal into a human, a landform, or a plant. Look at this image. You can see the ancestors on the outside in white. And then along the bottom we have fish, birds, mammals, and then humanoids, all inside this serpent. They call this creative ancestral energy the rainbow serpent. The snake, serpent, or dragon is another ubiquitous image across cultures from creation stories. It is the symbol of primordial transformation. Interestingly, ancient images of the serpent resemble the snake-like double spiral helix molecule DNA present in all living beings from bacteria to zebras. Just as the Australian Aborigines talk about their ancestors transforming, ancient Chinese literature describes many such transformations. Here's what Confucius said. The dragon is great indeed. While the dra dragon is able to change into a cloud, he is also able to change into a reptile, and also able to change into a fish, a flying bird, or a slithery reptile. No matter how it transforms, that it does not lose its basic form is because it is the epitome of spiritual ability. All creatures are ancestors of the dragon. To me, this sounds like a definition of DNA. Who was Confucius? He was a teacher, a philosopher, a politician who emphasized moral and sincere, moral and sincere dis discourse in government and personal life. Doesn't sound like somebody that would make up stories about dragons. In fact, many ancient Chinese writers describe these transformations and talk about dragons and unicorns. They say that during the harmonious times of paradise, such beings appeared. These, the unicorn, the dragon, so on, were sacred beings that appeared in the purest form. There were five classes of animals, and the purest form of each animal appeared. So the sacred animal of the hairy was the unicorn. The purest form of the scaly was the dragon. The sacred animal of the feathered was the phoenix. That of the armored, armored was the tortoise. And that of the naked was the sage. With the decline of human society, these beings became less visible. So I'm glad that we still see the tortoise. So maybe that means we haven't completely degraded altogether. In order to study Tibetan Buddhism, I went on a retreat with a lama by the name of Lama Lanang Rinpoche. And he told stories about dragons that he saw in Tibet. He says they still exist today. He saw a moth turn into a dust devil and become a dragon that became a large thunderstorm. These stories seem quite mystical to us sitting in Wisconsin today. However, uh, however another Rinpoche explains it like this. He grew up in Tibet before there were cars or even bicycles. So when people came through and told him that there were airplanes, houses with 400 people in them flying through the air, he could not believe it. Our past experience determines our beliefs. Of all the mystical creation stories I have studied, nothing is more mystical to me than embryology. 
So look at the top row. These are embryos that in the various forms of development. And as they develop, they become fish, salamander, tortoise, chick, rabbit, human. But up here, when they're early in development, they all kind of look the same. Be hard to tell them apart. I wonder if that isn't a dragon phase that all beings go through before development is further differentiated into the different classes of animals. Embryology amazes me. The study of how a sperm and an egg unite and grow into a neurologic system with complex structures like a brain, eyes, heart, and then they continue to develop into a trout or an ostrich or a salamander or an elephant or a human and almost always without mistake. We just accept that as natural. Have you ever really looked at how amazingly unbelievable that is? A molecule, DNA, a crystal gets all the credit. Fantastic. <coughs> DNA is a magical mystery tour onto itself. In 3.8 billion years, this molecule has multiplied itself into countless beings while remaining basically the same. It is the great shapeshifter. Anthropologist Jer Jeremy Darby calls DNA the cosmic serpent. He believes that when the Peruvian shamans eat the hallucinogenic plant ayahuasca, they communicate with a snake-like being that is DNA. These shamans say that God is in nature and this is how God communicates with them, through their hallucinations. And he tells them how to make medicine from plants. <coughs> or God, not necessarily he, sorry. <laughs> All creation stories describe a paradisal time when humans lived in harmony with the animals and ate the abundant vegetation. <coughs> And they all end with man's separation from paradise. In the Bible, this separation began when the humans ate the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil. This is a great image of the birth of duality. Right, wrong, good, bad, shame, pride. Remember, then they were ashamed and they covered themselves. Before this, they were naked and not concerned. So this dual mind created the image of self and other and life and death. Science and Chinese medicine, ancient Chinese philosophy, all sort of describe a similar creation. They talk about a oneness. A singularity is what, the, what uh, science calls it. We came from a singularity. And the singularity went into quantum fluctuation. It went into motion. And then, big bang, heaven and earth. The Chinese, the Taoists, they call this singularity Wu Ji. And Wu Ji, the supreme ultimate, went into motion. And boom, created duality, heaven and earth yin yang, right, wrong. So what I have found is that many cultures describe the same thing using different images. Here we have a <coughs> diploid cell on the bottom and the yin yang symbol on the top. Now, all you scientists and doctors who are out there, tell me where the DNA is in this diploid cell. Where's the DNA? Somebody, your doctor's out here, come on. Biologists, the DNA is in the nucleus of the cell. The ancient Chinese yin yang symbol, the Taoists, they call genetic material the Jing. Guess where the Jing is? In the dots. 
Connect the dots. It looks the same. So we have this duality that man created when he left the garden. <clears throat> However, shamans transcend duality. They can still visit spirit realm, communicate with animals, and they can actually transform into animals. Shape-shifting still occurs. A Christian minister who lived among the Navajo for many years was invited to a shaman ceremony. They built a ring of fire with a hole in the center of it. That night, they cut off a chicken's head and drained the blood into the hole. By morning, a six-foot-tall stalk of corn had grown there with three ears of corn on it. Another shaman told me how he watched his friend transform into an egret and how he himself changed into a bear. Shamans say that in spirit realm, an animal may appear as a human or vice versa. So I asked him, what's the difference in the spiritual nature of humans and animals? He saw that there was none. He said, you know, in, as humans, we think of everything like a corporation. There's CEOs and mid-level management and such. But in spirit realm, it's just spirit. It's all one spirit. Shamans believe that even in everyday normal waking life, a spirit may take the form of an animal. Last December, when my mother died, I received the news around 6 a.m. And just afterward, immediately afterward, I heard an owl hooting outside my window. And I opened the blind, and there was a large owl sitting in the tree right next to my office. And the hoot was so haunting. Birds, birds are messengers. And the Native Americans believe that the owl calls death. I felt like it was my mother coming to say goodbye. So I thanked her and said goodbye as the sun rose over the trees in the east and she flew into the sunrise. Since then, I've heard many stories from other people about how birds contacted them, trying to communicate with them immediately after the passing of a loved one. This is me riding my donkey in the Bistai Badlands of northwestern New Mexico. You can see it's a barren desert. Sparse vegetation, no trees. This is Navajo tribal land. And there are two other women riding with me. And uh, one of them had mentioned that the last time she was there, she saw a naked man. And as we were riding along, I saw a man in the distance get up from a rock. And I saw he had a straw hat on and a day pack. And I could also see his naked bottom as he scurried away. And we continued on riding. And uh, we rode past these large logs of petrified wood and these tall, steely hoodoos. And they have found large dinosaur skulls in the Bistai Badlands. It's a very barren place devoid of life. So you can imagine my surprise when something like this flew overhead. This is a snowy owl. Snowy owls breed in the Arctic tundra. We all saw it, but I was most shocked because I realized this is no place for a snowy owl. So we discussed the fact that the Navajo believe the owl is a bad omen because he calls death. He was silent. He silently soared slow, you know, right low above us. And so we thought, well, he's, he's white. It's got to be a good omen. The Native Americans believe that the white animals are the leaders of their kind. And white is the color of spirit. So we discussed the fact that maybe this naked man was a shape-shifting shaman flying by. I spoke with several ornithologists and shamans about it, and they left it up to me to decide what it was. So my conclusion was that no matter how lifeless a place is, spirit is always present. Man, after a man left paradise, he lived a nomadic lifestyle until settling into agricultural communities we now call pagan. 
the ancient tribal and agricultural people found nature to be spiritually fascinating. The religious awe of nature was the basis of ancient pagan beliefs. The great goddess, Mother Nature, Gaia, was seen as a sacred hole in which everything went through metamorphosis, like a butterfly, like a caterpillar into a butterfly. Children today still find these transformations fascinating. Eggs hatch into chickens, kittens come out of cats, tadpoles become frogs, as adults, we take these things for granted. There are still, still some fascinating animals out there that mystify us. For example, there is a mushroom, Cordyceps senescens mushroom, which is called winter worm summer grass, because in the winter it's a worm and in the summer it's a fungus. Mycologists aren't sure how this happens. They, they suspect that perhaps the worm, the arthropod, eats the fungal spore and it grows to take over the whole worm's body. There are many very fascinating creatures. <laughs> the name of the goddess varied with location. Isis in Egypt, Inanna in Samaria, Ishtar in Babylon, Anat in Canaan, Aphrodite in Greece. It was thought that when one died, the great goddess appeared as a bird, enveloping the body, the soul, like a mother meets her child, eating away the flesh and carrying away the spirit, recycling life. Thus, Isis is depicted with wings. The philosophy of reincarnation developed from observations of nature. Ice melts into water and evaporates as steam, only to condense into water and freeze again. One sees that nothing in nature is ever completely destroyed. Things merely transform. Therefore, the life force present in the material world must transmigrate, or in the case of animals, reincarnate. For Hindus, God is in every blade of grass, every creature, and even in the earth and sky. Our entire existence is like a dream in the mind of God. Although Hindus worship 330 million gods, they are all aspects of the one God. Hinduism is monism, not polytheism. The ancient Hindu text, the Veda, says truth is one, they call him by many names. This oneness embraces male and female and all the creatures. Each Hindu god rides an animal vehicle, which symbolizes something. The god, the elephant god Ganesha, elephant-headed god Ganesha, the remover of obstacles, rides a rat. The rat is the symbol of the ego. Egos make us vain, but they also make us creative. Without an ego, I wouldn't bother to write a book. So duality has both sides. Within the Hindu pantheon, there is a trinity. The creator god is Brahman, the savior god is Vishnu, and the destroyer god is Shiva. Vishnu, the savior, has incarnated numerous times in forever. And once he was uh, Krishna, who's the blue boy, and it's prophesized that Vishnu, the savior, will return again riding a white horse to uh, harvest those souls waiting for liberation. This resembles the story of Christ in Revelation, riding a white horse and carrying a sword. The commonalities between Hinduism and Christianity were not lost on the English, the British colonists who lived, who ran India for quite some time, and it resulted in uh, several religions being formed 
uh, including the Theosophical Society and the Self-Realization Fellowship, who believe that Hinduism and Christianity are teaching the same thing. This is our surrogate mother. The cow is the symbol of the great mother <coughs> whose milk feeds many. Thus, she is our surrogate mother. So the cow is sacred. All beings are a sacred part of the world. Hindus and Buddhists believe in the laws of karma and reincarnation. Karma results from action with intention. So if you are loving and kind, you may reincarnate as a healthy human. If you're greedy, you may come back as a pig, either two-legged or four-legged. <laughs> Karma is less important for animals because they are more instinctual and are bound by the mode of nature. Thus, a cat can kill a mouse without sin because she's not responsible for her choices. The most fascinating thing about Buddhism is that the Buddha Gautama sat under a fig tree in meditation around the year 500 BCE and realized what modern scientists only began to understand with quantum physics, that the world is empty. He saw that everything is interconnected and constantly changing. Nothing is permanent. In meditation, you let go of the dual mind, and it opens you up to the oneness. Advanced meditators like the Buddha was able to actually realize this. He said, Dear friends, I have seen deeply that nothing can be by itself alone, that everything has to interbe with everything else. Since everything is just energy, and that we're interconnected and constantly changing, and nothing is permanent, what reincarnates are the energetic residues of our actions. In this manner, our legacies are born again. Hindus and some Buddhists believe that a human may reincarnate as an animal, or vice versa. Remember, this is why the Buddhist woman hired me to let her help her dog die naturally, because she believed her dog could possibly become a human someday, or that it had been a human in the past. So she wanted her dog to live out her karma, his karma, so that she could have, he could have a better incarnation in his next life. This is Lama Saltram Aliani. This American woman, when she was a teenager, decided to go to India, and she decided to shave her head and become a nun. So she did that. She eventually released her vows and got married and had children. And in 1993, she started a Tibetan Buddhist retreat center near Durango at Pagosa Springs, Colorado, called Terra Mandala. In 2012, she was recognized as an emanation of an 11th century Buddhist woman and was given the title Lama. In 2004, I was having tea in her living room and her cat came on the table next to me and I was scratching his chin and his ears and he was really enjoying it. And Saltram said, wow, he really likes you. I said, he's a lover. And then she said, he's my father. <laughs> I said, pardon me? <laughs> she, a Tibetan monk who read incarnations had told her that her father reincarnated as her cat. She called him Pops. <laughs> Since the Buddha, the Buddha didn't talk about reincarnation. He was born in India and raised in India where in, reincarnation was a given fact. But his sole purpose in life was to figure out how to relieve suffering now, in the present moment. So rather than talking about past lives or future lives, he wanted to talk about how to relieve suffering in the present moment. So some Buddhists, like the Theravadins, do not believe in the transmigration of souls. Zen Buddhists, such as Thich Nhat Hanh, believe that when we die, we go back to the whole. He says, we're literally part of the whole now. Clouds make rain, 
for the grass to grow, for the cows to eat, to make milk for our yogurt. We are the yogurt, we are the milk, we are the cow, the grass, the rain, and the clouds. We are literally one in a giant recycling vat. A, uh, a clairvoyant woman told me that a human may choose to come back as an animal for a particular purpose. For example, a man with self-loathing would not be able to heal that emotion in a human body, but as a beloved family pet without the mental judgments of a human, he could heal that pain in a short 10-year lifespan. This is Temple Grandin. She's an autistic woman and professor of animal science at Colorado State University. I call her God's gift to cows because she's done more for animal welfare than anyone in my lifetime. If you've seen the movie about her life, you may remember the scene where she was a young woman and she discovered that her horse had died. And she looked down at the body and she asked, where did he go? Where did he go? Well, he's not here, she said as she walked away. It was intuitively obvious to that autistic girl that the energetic essence of her friend had evacuated the cell, the shell in which it once dwelled. And she wonders where it went. So do I. Near-death experiences speak of life after death. Most scientists believe that our brains create the near-death images. However, Neurosurgeon Dr. Eben Alexander disagrees. He describes his death in the book Proof of Heaven. He was brain dead and visited an indescribable spirit realm where he saw a dog. His brain was not functioning and could not have created what he saw. He claims to be able to convince any scientist of this with data from his doctors. Dr. Alexander compares his near death to what it would be like if an ant were a human for a day and then went back to tell the other ants about it. They would not understand. The Buddha faced the same dilemma after his enlightenment. We, we can't understand spirituality. Words are not able to explain it. This is why I find truth in science and many spiritual beliefs. They're all trying to explain the unexplainable using various words and images. We get all hung up about the words. We kill and hate each other over vocabulary. Near-death experiences tell us that we are here to help and love each other. Although most scientists claim there is no evidence that animals feel love, there is a test to determine who loves you more, your dog or your spouse. <laughs> you lock each one in a trunk of a car for an hour and find out which one's happy to see you when you let them out. <laughs> This is a joke, but it rings true, <laughs> right? It's an intuitively obvious that animals love their offspring. They love their companions, and they love the affection of their humans. Yes, we can learn to stay out of the trunk. And then we can be like the dog and get over it and be happy. Non-human animals do not suffer from the dual mind state and live more in the present moment than we do. We can learn a lot from our dogs. I want to share a couple of lessons I learned while in the process of writing this book. The first one came from a clairvoyant. <clears throat> a clairvoyant is someone who can see beyond the normal, the ordinary realm of vision. Some of the definitions I've read of clairvoyance say that they can see the future, and this is not true. The future is uncertain. No one can see it except for maybe Nostradamus, with few, few exceptions. So 
any psychic that tries to tell you something negative about the future is suspect, immediately and best avoided. The role of the clairvoyant and the shaman is the same. They are meant to help. They are in society to help people understand spirit realm better and help people and animals heal. So I went to this clairvoyant, who was a client of mine, and before each reading, she would say a prayer. She would ask divine love to guide and protect us and to give us information for our highest good and amusement. So I asked her some questions about the spiritual nature of animals. And when I told her how badly I felt when my patients didn't heal, she laughed. And then she laughed some more. She laughed until she cried and nearly fell off her chair. I felt offended and said, well, I'm glad I can be a source of entertainment for you. She wiped her eyes and said, I'm sorry, but it's not your fault if an animal doesn't heal. I said, really? What do people pay me for then? <laughs> and she said, there, yeah, yeah, you help for sure. But there's a lot more going on than just what you do. Maybe the animal had other plans. Maybe the people and the animal are trying to learn something together. I thought she was nuts at first, but then I realized how egocentric it is of me to think that I can heal every animal. She found my self-importance hysterical. <laughs> According to her, from the spiritual perspective, we all come into bodies for a particular purpose with a plan to learn lessons. I asked her, what do I do if an animal doesn't heal? And she said, you can always pray that it gets the healing it wants and let it go. Then she said something profound. Don't judge the situation. Judgment is pain. I began to realize that all the great teachers, all the great spiritual teachers said the same thing. Don't judge. Jesus said, judge not so you would not be judged. Zen Buddhist Thich Nhat Hanh says, remove judgment and pain disappears. Spiritual teacher Eckhart Tolle, who wrote The Power of Now, also teaches that pain results from judgment. And I realized that as soon as I judge someone, they judge me. What's worse is every time I have an opinionated judgment about something, I feel pain in my body. Let's use politics as a fun place to practice. <laughs> Think of something that really sets you off. Now notice where you feel it in your body. Head, stomach, back. With this observation, I decided I really don't want the pain anymore. And I've decided to let go of a lot of my negative opinions. And that helped me a lot. So all the spiritual teachers I've studied with resonate with Christ consciousness. So what was Christ? What was he about? How did he live? Jesus accepted everyone, lepers and whores. He forgave everyone. He said, don't judge, love everyone. He forgave everyone, even the people that hung him on the cross, nailed him on the cross, and said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. This kind of attitude of not judging and accepting, loving everyone and forgiving everyone, they've all told us this, all the great teachers, still we struggle. It's hard to do with our dual minds, always wanting to say what's right and wrong. If we just accept, something wonderful happens. The Hindus and Buddhists describe this non-dual mindset, this non-judgmental way of thinking as equanimity. Here is an example of how equanimity worked for me in veterinary practice. A stinky old golden retriever that could barely walk in the door was brought to my house. He had a large tumor on his side that was draining bloody serum all about the place. Everyone was telling his people to and his life and his suffering. 
but they still saw love in his eyes and weren't ready to let go and they wanted my help. It is my duty to let go of aversion and disgust, whatever, and do my job and try to find ways to help. And when I do that, when I don't judge, it's easy to say, put him down, but when I accept my duty and try to find ways to help, something wonderful happens. That acceptance opened my heart and I connected with the anima of the dog and the anima of the people and the anima they shared, their unconditional love. And it felt wonderful. Then I moved from acceptance to caring and I found ways to help. I clipped and cleaned the mass and found a big abdominal wrap to wrap around his abdomen to suck up the serum and cover it up because nobody wanted to look at it. And I found a soft ace bandage to hold it in place that the people could wash and reuse. I did acupuncture to help relieve pain and give him energy and I dispensed some Chinese herbs for pain. And everyone felt better. What's the hurry to kill the dog? We think the dog is suffering when in truth, our opinions, our judgments about the dog are so painful that we want to quick bury it so we don't have to look at it anymore. I have found a more joyful way. Just accept it. Forgive stupidity. We all do stupid things. Forgive your own stupidity. That's one of the hardest ones. It's, it's pure bliss not having an opinion. <laughs> Try it. Try it sometime. Just let go of your negative opinion and focus on helping. It feels wonderful. Though suffering is, a, is our biggest issue, there's purpose in suffering. The Taoists say the purpose of life is spiritual growth. Spirit can only grow in an alchemical cauldron of opposites. The body is that cauldron of spirit and matter, yin and yang. Here, we get to experience all kinds of contrasts that give us fuel for change. We realize right when we know wrong, understand peace after tumult, enjoy Ill health after illness. Duality has a purpose. Our choices teach us consequences. We suffer and learn. The ultimate goal is spiritual growth through transformation of suffering into wisdom and compassion. Although humans strayed from paradise, the animals still know we live in spirit realm. They still know we're all one, and they know there is no death. I hope all of you have felt the bliss of connecting with an animal. When you connect with an animal, you feel that pure, positive paradise. The best thing we can do to honor their service is to be grateful for all they do and give us. Thank you very much for your attention. Okay, well, um, we'll be open for questions for a bit here. Bring the microphone to you. Thank you very much for your presentation. Um, talked about different religions, and uh, I'm a Christian, so uh, excuse me for coming from, uh, from a Christian perspective and, and using the Bible, but God, God likes trinities, you know. He's the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and uh, I believe that humans are body, spirit, and soul, and there's no question that humans and animals have bodies, but I just wanted just quickly, you know, I think you've answered it. Do animals have souls? Yes. Okay. Do you believe that they're mortal or immortal? Immortal. Okay. Are they the same or different? Same. Okay. How about spirit? 
Do yeah. animals have spirits? Absolutely. Mortal, immortal, same? Immortal. Same, different? Eternal. It's all energy. It's all spirit. It's all one. Okay. Whatever. Yeah. And again, using the Bible as my reference, the soul, God talks about it having, having mind, intellect, emotions, and will. And yeah. you believe both humans and, and animals have all three of those. Yes. Okay, okay. They got the same hormones <laughs> okay. that give us the same emotions. Uh -huh. You know, estrogen, progesterone, testosterone. Uh, uh, what's the one that... Uh, no, the one that milks, makes the milk let down. Uh, uh, yes. And so, yeah, they, okay. they cause the emotions, and we have all the limbic system. The thing that the humans have different in the brain is the prefrontal cortex. And a group of prominent neuroscientists at the Francis Crick Memorial Conference on hu Consciousness in Humans and Non-Human Animals said that the prefrontal cortex is not responsible for consciousness, that there's nothing in the brain that humans have that makes them superior to animals in that way. And like the octopus has a donut-shaped brain. Anyway, anyway, go ahead. Anyway, just uh, I agree with the. Uh, you were uh, talking about the Bible and the breath of life, and yeah. I refer to Genesis for both for both uh, the breath of life um, that man, man and animals uh, gave both of them the breath of life. I agree that that humans and animals are living beings, but on the other hand, in Genesis it says that God made and created humans, created man in His image and the likeness of God. Mm -hmm. um, so I, 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 see, I, see, I see animals as living beings, and I see, I see humans as human beings, but I don't see animals as human beings. Who wrote, Gen who wrote Genesis? OK. Let me just point out that Genesis was written by the Hebrews. And as Christians, we tend to project Christian interpretation over it. Gershon Winkler, uh, the, a rabbi that I interviewed, says that he has a completely different interpretation. Let me put it that way, and we'll move on. It's in the book. Buy my book. <laughs> yes? I grew up uh, probably being taught that uh, animals don't have a soul. Yeah. But I don't think they needed to do this. But just a couple years ago, the Episcopal Church declared that we not only could, but we should pray for animals that are in distress, and that all creatures were uh, created, uh, you know, by by the Creator. And uh, once a year, we bring the animals into the church on Sunday morning. Dave Hathaway used to bring all three of the, uh, and uh, Mary Ellen would help him, and they would go to the altar, and they would uh, receive a blessing. The dogs would right. go to the altar, receive a blessing, and then we gave them a St. Francis uh, tag to put on their, uh, right. their collar. So, uh, right. you know, for what it's worth. For, and that's why St. Francis preached to the animals. He preached to the animals because God said to preach to everything, right? Next question, yes. Have a comment. I have a service and you have a what? A service dog. Yes. And she goes to church with me every Sunday, and I don't go anywhere without her. Nice. Um, what? Her by the agency um, in Washington State where I got her. They asked me what I liked best, and I said when I looked into her eyes, I could see her soul. Right. And we had an immediate spiritual connection. Right. And that has not only lasted, but it's deepened in, at her. Um, so I, I truly believe that animals are spiritual. And dog is God spelled backwards. That's right. That's proof right there. That's proof. I kind of have two questions. Yes. One is, as a veterinarian, um, and I've taken many animals to the vet to have them put down, and the vet would say, well, they're not suffering or they are suffering. And I always think, how do you know? Mm -hmm. Does the science support conditions where an animal is suffering or not? And my next, my other question kind of related to that is, 
um, if we stop thinking dualistically, then to put an animal down is just a continuation of life. It isn't separate, right? Correct. Uh, yeah, what was that first part again? <laughs> oh, how, how do you know oh, so it can be kind of subjective, you know, and I think veterinarians have more training to know, you know, by checking the vital signs, you know, and temperature and, and heart rate and respiratory rate, and, you know, there are more sophisticated ways, and, um, you know, the Buddha said all is suffering. We suffer all the time, and so it's, you know, it's a matter of perspective. Some people think their animal is suffering horribly, and I look at it and go, really? I've seen a lot worse than that. I don't know. It seems fine to me, you know? I mean, it, it can be uh, an opinion, but um, I think we just, people are so hung up on the idea of suffering that it's nice to know once they're free of the body, they aren't suffering anymore. Yes, in a body, we suffer. Okay, you had talked about um, animals and, you know, that you ask them the question and let them answer to you. I got a new horse I, three years ago now, and he's very unpredictable. Um, I've gone for walks with him. I've asked him. I've tried asking him, you know, and he, he doesn't give me an answer. And you'll hear about other, like, animal communicators, and there's a lady out of Milwaukee, but she said she'll just call you. Mm -hmm. You know, if I contacted this lady, is it something that she could, you know, be that mediator between us? Yeah. So it is, it's uh -huh. not a, you can do a gimmick it. I, or, you I know. I do it on the internet with pictures. I like to see the eyes. Sure. And, um, yeah, they can be, that can happen. That can work. He is the offspring of my very first horse, and I refuse to give up on him. But, I mean, yeah. he can be the greatest horse, you know, for two weeks straight, and then... You know, all of a sudden it's, you know, he bucks and bucks and bucks and rears and we've ruled out pain. We've, saddle you know, fit. we've had a saddle, you know, fitter look at it. And, you know, they've told me that it's a behavioral thing. And, you know, this summer he's been pretty good, but, you know, he's so unpredictable. Yeah, that's scary. You know, and I feel like he wants to tell me something. And it's like, you know, his mom is buried on my property. So I kind of wonder, you know, is that something to do with his mom? you know, on our property that he's trying to tell me something or? It's really hard to start communicating with your own animal because you have all that you project all this, these thoughts like that out there, which I just had a lady in my office the other day and she said, you know, this dog was brought in with another dog to the Humane Society and, I, and that dog went to another home. Does he miss that dog? And, you know, I asked him, he said, no. She's like, oh, good. And she, she started out by telling me, I, I never wanted this dog. I just wanted to give him a new home. And so I think he wants a home where there's children and other pets. Will you ask him? And so I asked him, I go, do you, do you want a home with children and pets? And he's like, I like pets. I like other dogs. You know? And I go, would you rather be with them or with her? And he says, I like her. And I said, well, he goes, but she, she tells everybody she doesn't want me. And I told her that. She said, Oh, no, I do want him. I love him, you know? And he's like, I know. <laughs> you know, so sometimes it can be so helpful to have someone talk for you. Oh, my name's Lori. Thank Hi, you Lori. for your talk. And um, let's see if I can focus this. Um, this, uh, this facts and opinions and experiences. So the next thing I'm going to ask you is sort of your experience and um, opinion. You talk. Some people are more attracted to some animals than others. Mm -hmm. So I've noticed that, you cat person, dog person, I'm a rabbit person, whatever, you know. But anyway, so my thought that to make it to, to the group, do you have any thoughts on, so you said how um, spirit, the spirit of an animal is, might be attracted to the spirit of a person, and we have lessons to learn from each other. I'm going along that line of thinking. Right. So what are your thoughts and experiences why perhaps some people are attracted more to one breed or class of animal than others, or is it an individual thing? Um, it kind of goes with that, two horses, but different yeah. personalities. Could, could be an infinite number of reasons and, and opinions. Of, you know, uh, I just was thinking about my clairvoyant friend who, she said it works like this. So from spiritual perspective, the human is asking for help. They have a broken heart, which was her case. And she said, so Spirit says, who wants to go help Dana with her broken heart? And Honey Bear says, I'll go. So Honey Bear comes to be a dog for 
or Dana to help her. I just listened to a podcast about a woman who had a near-death experience, and she said when she got to Spirit Realm, she was like, okay, I don't want to go back. She got, she got uh, bombed in Iraq and had shrapnel on her head and stuff, and she uh, said, I don't want to go back. And they said, okay, uh, but how about if you went back and did this? And she said, okay. You know, it's like it all seems so easy from spiritual perspective. She wanted to come and teach people more about Spirit Realm, and... So she came back. Yes. Thank you. I, I understand this. I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Yes, um, I seen in all your stuff that you talked about like Buddhism and all that. Yeah. Have you talked to, I have a lot of Native American in me. Uh-huh. Did you talk to a lot of Native American people to get some yes. research? Because yes. everything to them, it, it, you know, they have, the, is, is very spiritual. They, right. They, you know, animals are spirits. Everything is very spiritual. Right, all the shamanism stuff was, not all of it, some was from Russia and other other shamans around the world, Peruvian stuff, but Native American shamans, I, I sweat lodged with them and talked with them and yeah, and they're the ones that, you know, say the owl is the messenger of Navajo tribal land, that was all Native American, the Bistai Badlands. I spoke to those shamans and asked them, you know, what's this white owl about? So yeah, it's spirit. It's all spirit. Everything is spirit. All we have is 5% that we think is us separate. We make that up for the purpose of spiritual growth. So. We have time for one more question. I, just as you were talking about the Native Americans, I had heard or read over years that an animal decide when it's going to allow you to see it. Oh. And it will show itself right, to you. Right, right. And I just that's like, so that's like the, uh, the ancient Chinese saying, you know, with the degradation of human society, these pure beings became less visible. Mm -hmm. So when, you're, when your uh, consciousness evolves mm -hmm. more, you start to see the spirit beings. Yeah, there was, this was even talking in, in terms of perhaps a deer in the forest. Yeah. A rabbit, you know, right. whatever, yeah. that it decides to show itself. Oh, that's cool. Thank you. Let's give a great round of applause. Thank you.